There's a bridge. That's where it starts. A bridge in an unidentified town. Unidentified, except for that it's near Stockholm. That's where it starts. But it's not about the bridge. It's just that you have to know about the bridge so you can understand what it actually is about. Except you already know what it's about, because it's about you. It's about you, and your parents, and your children, and your partner, and it's about everyone you know, and it's about you. It's about all of the ways that you feel about all of the people you know, and it's about coincidences, and fate, and a terrible idea that spirals out of control. Except it's not about a loss of control, it's about connection, and it's about love, and it's about not saying it when you should say it, and feeling it, and pretending to not feel it out of embarrassment for someone else, and the little things you stop yourself from doing to help someone else feel important. It's about feeling guilty of the effort others put towards making you feel important. It starts with a bridge in a town outside Stockholm. If you ask anybody else what it's about, and if that person is uncomfortable, as we all are uncomfortable, with admitting that this is about our own fears, insecurities, and self. If you ask someone like that, like me, and their walls are up, the way walls are always up. If you ask them what Frederick Backman's book, Anxious People, is about, they'll say it's about a bank robbery, a hostage drama, a group of people eating pizza. But they're lying, because that's just the story. The book? What it's about? It's about the ways we love each other. This book. It's about everyone. So let's talk about that. But first, disclaimer time! This is not a review show! I am nerd incorrect. I'm passionate, opinionated, highly subjective, and so many, 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 many times incorrect. I have to repeat, this is not a review show. I'm not going to objectively weigh any piece of art on any merits. What I will do is explore the things that make entertainment beautiful and explore the art created for us to consume while we live our lives. Thank you for joining me while I explore the adventures we have from inside the house. I'm on cool, I'm the earth going to everyone's bill. Murray, I've been broke in every sense of the word. And I, I keep chasing my next high score. Issues galore, I'm a walking, talking magazine. We all know that nobody reads. What's the use in words when they don't even understand me? Welcome to The Adventures We Have From Inside the House, a podcast about entertainment, how and why we consume it, and how it shapes our lives. And more importantly, a podcast that celebrates the things you like, even if nobody else does. My name is Tim Riel, and I am Nerd Incorrect, the boy who loves entertainment of every kind and always seems to fall in love with the properties and art that don't always follow the crowd. A kind friend, a very kind friend of mine, uh, one who's been with me through many, many of my personal challenges, and who has been gracious enough to listen to me when I was uncomfortably frank and uncomfortably open, this friend texted me about a year ago and said the kindest and most incorrect thing. They said, I just read a book, and it was beautiful and incredible, and the entire time I was reading it, all I could think was, this is what a book written by Tim would be if he would just sit down and write a book. Let me be very clear. Anxious People by Frederick Backman is a beautiful and incredible book. I could never write something this good. I'm not being modest or disingenuous or self-deprecating. This level of beauty is beyond my capabilities, I think. It would be more accurate to say, if I were to write a book about how I believe that everyone is flawed, everyone is struggling, everyone is trying to be better, And that we're all the same in how we want to be happy and make the people we love happy and how we all feel like we're failing at that. How the people we feel we are failing also feel they're failing because they're trying to make us happy. And we're not happy because we feel we're failing. If I were to try to put down all of my fears, my hopes, my dreams into a novel, I would want it to be Frederick Backman's Anxious People. 
I've had plenty of time to discuss this book with my very kind friend who insists that the tone, the language, the ideas of the book are not dissimilar to many of our late night discussions of life and that the cadence of prose Mr. Backman writes is one they're accustomed to reading in my own works. I suppose I can see that if begrudgingly. It's one of the reasons I enjoyed my first read of the book so much. The vanity of reading something you can pretend you might have written, (laughs) that did it for me. That's the great trick of writing about the universality of being a human. Everyone can feel ownership of the book, because this story is about everyone. I've read the book a few times, and each time has been special for me. And within a small, vain part of myself, and in discussions with a very kind friend, I can pretend it's an accomplishment that I could be capable of. This is not a review of anxious people. You know that. So, if you want an official stance, I believe you should read this book. I will, several more times. Anxious People hangs its soul on a fun and clever mystery and a cast of characters that are delightful. But the book itself, the reason I believe it succeeds as well as it does, is its simple exploration of what it means to care about people. And more importantly, that indescribable feeling of not being able to tell people that you care. Through the connections of the characters that know each other and their new connections with the strangers they find themselves with, Backman finds a beautiful way to weave the different kinds of love and care and yearning and fear that people have for each other. It's masterful in its art. It's not a terrible story either. Anxious People starts well enough. The exposition is fascinating. The structure of the writing is intriguingly quirky. There's whimsy in the way the sentences are constructed. It's playful and funny and strange. It never really lets you go. You have a busy life and you have things to do, so you need to stop. You need to put this book down. But you just want to see if it might be something you'll read when you have the time. So when the next paragraph ends, you tell yourself, this is a good place to stop. But still, you glance at the next paragraph to decide if you can stop here. And then you don't. You keep reading. Because that next sentence is really good. And then you're 40 pages in and it's settled. You're reading this book now. If there is a flaw with this book that may turn others away from reading it, it's the introduction to the characters I'll refer to as the apartment people. They're off-putting. They're annoying. And the writing of their dialogue is an amateurishly ill-conceived attempt at humor. And what one can only assume was the writer believing they could pull off the slapstick, silly banter of an Abbott and Costello routine. He cannot. The bit goes on too long, the characters don't feel believable, the whole thing is stretched too far into the absurd that the entire piece is ruined by this badly designed farce. This is where many people would stop. And rightfully so. Many reviews mention that this is where they stopped. How can anyone with half a brain think that a book with these characters could be any good? That's what they say. But I trust my very kind friend. Which is the only reason why I kept reading. Even after the fourth awful scene of over-the-top insanity and vapid attempt at creating a dumb, silly, idiot character scene. Many people, based on some reviews, did not have a very kind friend that they trust. So they don't know what I know. I'm not going to ruin any part of this story, except this part right here. Frederick Backman is not an awful, amateurish writer with an inability to write humor. He's a writer who keeps in mind the motivations of all of his characters at all times. Nobody in this story is an empty-headed moron stumbling around like an idiot. Nobody. These people are talking and acting like this because they are motivated to within the context of the story. So please, when you get to this point, keep reading. The book has been adapted and is a Netflix series right now. Please don't watch the Netflix series until you read the book. The series is pretty good. I wouldn't skip it, but please read the book. It's a mystery book of sorts, and frankly, knowing the secret kind of sucks the air out of the plot. And the plot is the framework on which this incredible journey through human relationships drapes its abundant and warm furnishings. It's a book that deserves to be read. The series does many things that a series would have needed to do, but ultimately, those things blunt the message. They limit the impact you should get from this story. Ultimately, it's many little stories explored around the central conceit. But because of the adaptation and its limitations, some characters are absent, some storylines are altered, some outcomes are changed, 
And more importantly, several character motivations are irrevocably transformed, which lessens the message and strips some characters of their own growth and independence. There is one storyline in the show, and only one, that rises to its literary source's grace and excellence. There's a pregnant couple, and their adapted story is wonderful. It's most of episode four, if you're looking for it. The book is probably better, but this part still made me happy. The show, had I not read the book, would have been fine, but I'm not sure I would have watched the whole thing. I also don't think it's totally worth your time. And it most certainly should not be used as a way to not read the book. Read the book! I found myself, throughout most of this book, reliving and exploring moments in my own life and remembering the emotions and the anxiety and the times I didn't say what I should have said or the times I did say what I shouldn't have. It's difficult when presented with circumstances and situations you most certainly have been faced with in some way or another. Anxious people isn't fantastical. It isn't outlandish or extreme Save for the fact that a story's ecosystem needs to be small, and so circumstances and coincidence needs to be present, nothing here is out of the ordinary. It's all things you've dealt with before, and will deal with again. When I'm in a relationship of any kind, romantic, parental, friendship, I hyper-focus and devote my time and attention to that person. There was a lot of that in this book. The idea of forming a team, creating a bond that would keep you happy, and be enough. That dynamic plays out in a lot of ways, and every person in the story is trying their best to be enough for the person they've chosen. I've spent, and continue to spend, a lot of time worried that I am letting the people I love down. Am I a good enough father? Because I could certainly be doing better. Am I a good son? Because I don't do much to merit that title. Am I a good enough partner? Because nobody has agreed that I am up to this point. How many of those people I feel I'm letting down feel the same way? That they're letting me down? Because thinking that might be true makes me feel like I'm failing at letting them know that they aren't letting me down. And does that feeling add to their feeling of failure? That's what is at the core of this book. It's also at the core of my life. And I wonder if it's at the core of yours. I struggle with romantic relationships because I feel that I don't live up to what a person I would want to be with expects of a partner. And indeed, I haven't managed to stay with anyone that fits that description. There are things about my day-to-day that simply aren't enticing. I'm not an event planner. I spend a lot of time in my head with my big ideas. The people I love and have loved, all I need is for them to be near and want to be near, which may sound cute. It has certainly been interpreted as cute when I explain that I can go to the grocery store, drive for hours, or sit on a couch reading a book so long as the person I love is near me. Everything is perfect so long as they're there. Super romantic. Except what that means is I'm happy doing nothing so long as they're there. It means that I'm not the the take-you-to-the-beach guy, the rent-a-horse-and-buggy guy, the theme-date-night guy. And I think that's what people want. And sometimes it is what they want. But even if it isn't what they want, what they definitely don't want is the guy who's worried that he's not doing enough, so he's stressed and unhappy because he's not doing enough to make you happy because you can't make that guy happy. I sometimes think I'm a pretty great dad. I love my daughters. I would do anything for them. And I think they're having a pretty great childhood. And then I think about how we don't have a tradition of going camping. We don't have the memories of a special place that's just for us. Not in the way that I read in books or see on TV. Not in the way that there'll be a flashback in a film of a family that always reads the same book on the same hill overlooking the same lake just before the sun sets. Except I'm sure my kids do have those memories. I'm sure we do the things that are tradition and memorable and important. It might just be that I want to give them more, have more, and I'm not seeing what I'm giving through my forest of things I feel I'm failing to give them. I think my dad is proud of me. I'm not a successful writer. I'm not a successful actor. Not a successful comedian. Certainly not a successful partner or husband. I think my dad probably had a lot of dreams for me. And I know that divorced dad with a regular job wasn't on the list. I worry that I've let him down. That he had hoped for someone extraordinary and instead got run of the mill. Except I know that's not true. Because I don't think that way about my kids. My big-time dreams for them are in the same area as my big-time dreams for winning the lotto jackpot. 
it would be super cool if it happened, but it's never what would make me happy. I think I'm a good person and that my dad is happy. I wish I could take him on week-long father-son trips to do whatever. I wish I called him more often. I wish I wasn't aware that he feels exactly the same way. That sometimes he doesn't think he was a good enough dad. That he's worried I'm disappointed. I wish either of us were the type of person that could accept the other saying I'm proud without shrugging it off and only keeping it for ourselves in a small warm spot in our hearts. Because we kind of don't believe it and we kind of think they're just saying that to make us happy. Because everything we do is to make them happy. Most of all, I wish I didn't feel like a bother to everyone I love. It's hard to make plans and reach out when you're afraid that they'll have to cancel something or sacrifice something to cater to my personal whims. That they'll feel like I'm demanding and overbearing and I'll feel like they resent having to make me happy. Because I don't plan things. Which means I'm just asking for them to be with me without offering them something of value like a meal or an activity because I feel like I'm not enough. These are the thoughts that are brought up within me as I read this book. It's these insane, destructive thoughts that are explored by Mr. Backman through these characters and their relationships. And it's these feelings that are exposed as universal and universally wrong. It's the anxiety that comes with caring for someone so much that you can't bear to see them unhappy. And those people, the ones that care about you, they can't bear to see you unhappy. And if you don't face that, be vulnerable enough to say that then all you got is two people making themselves miserable because the other person isn't happy. When the cure, of course, is for both of you to just be happy. I don't know if I will ever be secure enough in myself to believe that I make the people I love happy. I'll likely fall back into myself because I could do more. And when I do, this book is here to remind me of what is actually true. And that it's hard. And that everyone I love feels the same way. This book will remind me that I need to tell my mom that she makes me happy and that I'm proud of her. To let my dad know that he's incredible, always. To let my daughters know that every single day my life is good because they are perfect and how can a man have been so lucky as to have them both in his life. To tell my friends that they're loved and appreciated and I probably won't call because I don't want to be a bother but that they are never a bother and can call me anytime. It really is a good book. I wish I had written it. Our theme music is provided by Double Experience. You can find the track Bill Murray everywhere you get music. And my ability to take time out of my week to make this podcast is supplied by my supporters at patreon.com slash nerdingcorrect. If you support us on Patreon, thank you. And because you do, you're listening to this episode a week before anybody else. And if you want to be part of that club, head on over to patreon.com slash nerdincorrect, where you get early access to all our podcasts, an exclusive podcast, and so much more. You can also join our Nerd Incorrect Discord server, The Incorrection, where we can discuss in more depth everything I talked about today. If you want your question and or comment about today's podcast featured in next week's episode of discussing the adventures we have from inside the house, you can drop it into our podcast-specific Discord channel or comment on the Patreon post of this episode. All of the comments on the Patreon will be featured, and if possible, as many of the Discord comments as well. I'm Tim Riel. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll talk to you next week as we discuss more of the adventures we have from inside the house. I'm uncool, I'm the uncle that everyone's built no, And that's alright with me Cause I'm a walking, talking magazine We all know that nobody reads But what's the use of words when nobody understands me? What's the point of trying to be someone that I can't be?